Um, you know, when we talk about internationalization, you know, for a lot of people, and this is this is a funny thing that we find across customers, the words internationalization and localization almost get replaced by each other and used very freely. We in the industry have a distinction in that internationalization really um, you can talk about it in software, uh, 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 in a software mindset or just a general product mindset. Basically, you're taking whatever product it is that you have and making it so it works. One product will work efficiently no matter what the locale, locale being you know the target market. So if your locale is the UK, you can't just say English. You're talking about UK English. If your target market is, say, um, Spain, Spanish, then uh, Spanish in Spain is different than Spanish, let's say, in Mexico. So we talk about locale versus languages quite often, especially in terms of internationalization. Um, but it is the process of engineering a product so it can be adapted to target languages and regions efficiently and without requiring a lot of different engineering changes every time you want to add a language. Um, and again, we, we said this, so I'll keep moving. Uh, it is a critical step before localization can occur. Sometimes we see companies that break that rule and they localize before they really should have. The problem is that they fork their code, they end up with two products to support or N products to support depending upon how many languages. Often you see that when a distributor takes over, over let's say, Japaneseizing, Japanizing a product or, or, or that, that's an example. Localization is the now focused adaptation of that product. So in internationalization, we made it general, so it works everywhere. Localization, we make it quite specific. Um, again, we have the abbreviation being L10N. And it includes the translation, but also the application of locale-specific behavior. That's what makes it a little bit special beyond translation. We're adapting it so it behaves as the user expects it in this other country. And, um, you know, a funny thing we like to point out is if the product hasn't been internationalized or localized, well, it actually is inherently localized. It's inherently localized for the product you released it in. So if you develop a product in the United States and you meant it for the U.S. market, it's inherently localized for the U.S. market. So, again, we're taking that that kind of uh, uh, thinking and we're saying, well, we're going to make it so it works everywhere. Now, globalization, for our intensive purposes, it's not just people marching uh, and striking in Seattle, but it is uh, uh, the uh, combination in our terms that we're talking about, the combination of the internationalization and localization activities. It's a dangerous word because it means a lot of different things to different people. Now, um, Within, we talked about internationalization preceding localization. Uh, Lingoport, again, is really focused on internationalization. We've developed products and services specifically for that and help customers move quickly with their internationalization efforts. And then we tightly partner on localization so that, you know, the combined effect is you get a real coordinated effort uh, between the, between internationalization and localization. Whether you use us or you do this stuff independently, uh, one of the things you should walk away with is that localization isn't something you just work on after you internationalize. You, you really need to be kind of bringing both processes together so they're each aware of it, uh, each other. It makes for a much higher quality global release. I'll say that a few times during this presentation. So. Um, you know, I think uh, 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 I made it clear uh, in the last slide, we partner because together we support the greater needs of the customers pretty pretty closely. Uh, now, your business case for globalization is has a lot to do with everything from strategic uh, initiatives or to somebody went and sold something, and so tactically you've got to release it now for that sale to happen. Um, but it does change a company. So when a company internationalizes, they fundamentally change how they do things. Uh, generally, they, they, you fundamentally change the world view. Keeping that world view changed is kind of an ongoing battle, battle um, which we'll, have, we'll touch on that. So I'm going to talk about some basic internationalization issues here. Um, 
you know, within internationalization, there's several different areas. At a very high level, we see, um, uh, uh, you know, the basics around how does data flow through the application. People talk about embedded strings, uh, character encoding, locale support, database refactoring, and third-party product support. We'll go into most of these uh, a little bit in the next couple of slides. First of all, um, you know, an early conversation uh, we almost al always have with an engineering team is, you know, I'll use round numbers. Let's say an application has a million lines of code. Um, someone will pipe up from the engineering department and say, well, yeah, there's a million lines of code, but, you know, the user interface is only 10% of that or, or 100,000 lines, so don't you only have to look at the user interface? The answer is no. Uh, uh, while the user interface does involve a lot of what you see in internationalization in terms of the, the, the UI display, uh, there's generally a lot more to people's software than just what they initially see on the screen. So uh, we need to be conscious of uh, what just about any software is doing is it has some kind of UI display that then re resolves some user input that gets put into software that may transform it in some ways. It, it gets stored or within a database that information. It gets retrieved in some way, combined perhaps with something else, um, and transformed somehow and then displayed again. That's how software just works. And in that full data path is a lot of places are a lot of places for things to go wrong with internationalization. Um, you really need to think instead as your software being uh, 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 you know, a system that like you had marketing requirements when you first built the application and all the parts of it worked underneath the umbrella of those marketing requirements, now you're adding locale behavior. So you know, how is a, you know, a simple example is how is a phone number going to be rendered or an address or um, a time or a date or uh, perhaps uh, how is sorting happening. Uh, but uh, uh, additionally, what are the zeros and ones that go in behind every character that you see on the screen? An interesting note here, if there's anybody from WebEx, I am presenting from my desktop because um, when we ran through a test yesterday, uh, when we were using the WebEx tool rather than the desktop tool, it corrupted characters that I have later on in the presentation. So um, that's an example of, sure, the interface looks fine, but is there some corruption of the characters that turns it into junk? I'll show some examples of that. Um, you know, so there are all these issues that happen as the software moves around. So you have to look at the whole package uh, here's just some high-level bullets that I, I put together here. Um, but then if we look at a real piece of code, here's an example. Let's say we have, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, a million lines of code. We might come up with, say, 40,000 embedded strings. These are strings that would be part of the interface. So here's an example, uh, uh, you know, showing the string would be that would be presented as your order has been processed, a confirmation email will be sent to you shortly. Now, the problem with those strings being embedded in your code is a translator can't get to it. They actually need to be taken out of your code and put somewhere else nice and pretty uh, uh, in a file. In this case, it would probably be a properties file. Uh, um, but uh, uh, you put them off so that you can send the translator the properties file, and they can work without, without, without being in danger of sending the actual source code to a translator where it can get broken easily, even by accident. Um, so this is an example of, a, of, of an, this same string extracted. You see the same uh, order status uh, function here. And uh, we've used get string as the command to go get the string, and this is, you know, basically uh, uh, the order status function and the, uh, an abbreviation of the string being your order, the first two letters, and then the string ID, which is 101. So each string gets its own identification number um, that could then be matched. So now when you go and you have to make a German version of this string, for instance, you have a string ID associated here, and when you you have a locale operator that knows to look for that string in German uh, later on. 